Hey, this is Anthony, and I'm the host of What They Did Not Teach You in School, the podcast that interviews people to get their wisdom recorded so that hopefully you could learn some things that are not taught in school, but should be taught in school. I'd like to remind people that a lot of the things talked about on this podcast relate to investing and finance. The purpose of talking about these subjects are to hopefully inform people and educate them on financial literacy and to entertain people with some do's and do nots. This is not to be considered financial advice. Before trying anything that you learn on the podcast, be sure to consult a professional. Hello, 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 and welcome to this week's episode of What They Did Not Teach You in School. Today is actually episode 44, and I have joining me today Jason Silver. Jason Silver, I met through, how did we meet actually? It's a great question. I think someone uh, introduced us. Bumped into you into the street, and next thing you know, here we are. We were talking about entrepreneurship <laughs> and mindset and decision making, and I was like, hey, like this should be a podcast. Instead of sitting on the corner of the street here, you want to bring it inside. Yeah, you didn't have the microphones outside. I actually just met you like 20 minutes ago. (laughs) In the line for coffee. (laughs) And um, so, yeah, he calls himself a startup personal trainer, which I thought was really interesting being a founder myself. I wanted to learn a little bit more about you, your mindset, the book that you have coming out and what you do for entrepreneurs and helping them with their mindset and just overall decision making and growth. Our audience is really uh, a lot of entrepreneurs, so I thought that would be relevant um, for this podcast specifically. Um, So thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. All right. So uh, Jason loves to help people enjoy doing hard things. Um, uh, a big theme in his life is startups, working on creating something new. He's a multi-time founder of, of kids, which I loved. <laughs> multi-time founder of kids and a multi-time founder of companies. He's been fortunate to play a role in helping to grow Airbnb in its early days and contributing to Canada's leadership in AI through building Integrate.ai from the ground up. He considers himself equally lucky to have experienced both raising significant venture capital as well as getting through a startup failure. He's been surrounded by great people throughout his career. He learned a lot uh, through meeting new people, and he loves learning new things. Um, He's a big reader, mostly historical fiction for fun, as well as neuroscience, behavior, psychology, and philosophy. And he loves understanding or learning more about why we think and act the way we do, which I guess is one of the inspirations to your book. Yep. Um, And figuring out people and team dynamics is one of the things that excites him. And if something, I quote this, if something is, it can't be, if someone says it can't be done, he wants to try and solve it. So Jason, I just think you're a really interesting guy and I want to see where uh, the next little while goes with you. So I thought this would be a good moment to timestamp Jason Silver's mind and body (laughs) in this moment. What day is it today? June 30th. And maybe in five to 10 years from now, we'll be able to revisit that. (laughs) Timestamp away. Okay, so for the people that are listening and don't know too much about you, I kind of want to go through what makes you tick. What was your background and what has led you here today for the first five minutes of the podcast to get... I always like understanding someone's uh, background story as, cool. a, as when I was younger and still to, to this day, I always loved looking people up on Wikipedia and being like, what, what was their family dynamic? What school did they go to? What was their first job? What hardships did they have in their life? And that was, that's a good indicator to see why they are what they are today. So tell us a little bit about yourself and what has led you to this moment in time. Cool. I'll, um, I'll explain it and then you can, uh, you can pick it to pieces and tell me what you learned from it. So, uh, engineer by training did, uh, did a master's in, um, electrical computer engineering focused on, um, biomedical engineering, thought I wanted to be an engineer, left engineering school, worked as an engineer, kind of hardware, software, realized relatively early on that, um, I was most interested in like the business side. I I really got very interested in like, how do you build a great team around a great product? That's going to make it into a great business. You know, the great product I used to think like you create a great product takes care of itself, blissfully ignorant. That's not actually what happens. Uh, There's a lot that needs to go on after the fact. So I wanted to get into business. I didn't want to go back to school. I just finished a bunch of a bunch of school. Um, Wound up getting pretty lucky, found a startup here in Toronto, convinced them, hey, like there's nothing on paper that says, uh, you know, I'm going to be able to do business, but I, I think I can, you know, take a shot. I wound up jumping 
uh, working for them for free for the first little bit just to kind of get in in the door um, felt like the first really crazy thing that I did got some interesting feedback from the family on that one uh, but it wound up going really well you know they kind of took me under their wing I got put into a lot of situations that at the time were very above my pay grade kind of like sit here don't talk but you can sit here as long as you're taking notes and so I got exposed to like how do you raise money for a company how does that side work how do you do do like commercialization deals partnership deals um, I got very interested in starting my own company, had a software project on the side, again, kind of blissfully ignorant, like, let's do this. It'll be, you know, how hard could it be kind of a thing? Um, turns out very hard, um, jumped in, did that built up, like, I guess what you would call today, like a lifestyle business, you know, hit maybe a single or a double. Um, my partner wanted to kind of run it as a lifestyle business. I wanted to go bigger at the time. So we split very amicably and I went the more traditional, is that the right word, route of like raise some VC money, built up a company, couple of years, um, crashed the company, which was, you know, interesting experience. Happy to chat about it if you want to, but very, very formative, um, very challenging time for sure. And then I got lucky again. Uh, one of my investors whose money I almost entirely lost, I guess had thought enough of me as we were going through the process and I was working on the business. He put me in touch with the team. He said, hey, I think you should go and chat with this team. You might find them really interesting. And that was the folks at Airbnb um, in the earlier days there. So I joined there before the company was what it is today. You know, it was out of the startup stage, but it was in that scale up stage. I joined when we were, you know, hundreds of people. I got to experience what like the true Silicon Valley, hundreds of people to thousands of people in a very short amount of time ramp looks like. So that was an interesting experience. I had my first kid on the way. Um, I had teams kind of reporting into me from different places. I was on an airplane all the time. I wanted to be based out of the same city that my family, uh, my son was going to be born into, obviously. And I did the only thing I really knew how to do. I uh, joined a very early stage startup. Seemed like the right idea. New kid, why not take a gigantic career risk at the same time? That was Integrate. Love the company. Uh, it was very early stage at the time. There were like two people, half a slide deck, no product, no customers, you know, as, as early as you can get. Built that up to a certain stage. Um, and then, uh, you know, had a moment in my life that really kind of pushed me out of my day to day and, and led me to really think about like, how am I living my life? What do I want to be doing? I felt very grateful that I had been able to learn a lot of incredible lessons in a relatively short time. And I wanted to experience paying that forward as like my primary focus, uh, you know, at that stage in my career, rather than, you know, when I'm going to right before I'm going to retire, which is like the traditional time to do it. Right. And I jumped into this thing that I now call startup personal training. Um, I don't know if there's another one in the world. It's a term I think I made up if anybody else is listening. I've never they, heard of it yeah. before. If somebody else is out there listening and they do this kind of thing, I'd love to meet them. But the idea was like, I wanted to do something that I always wanted when I was kind of sitting in the founder or the executive um, seat of a startup. And the idea of startup personal trainer came from like a personal trainer in a gym. I know you were you're at the gym this morning. The way a good personal trainer works in my experience is like sometimes they're they're standing there like telling you how to do an exercise that you've never done before. Sometimes they're spotting you, right? They're like they have their arms underneath your elbows so that as you're lifting up the gigantic dumbbells, like you don't drop them on your head and kill yourself. And then sometimes they want to get a workout themselves. So they actually sit next to you and like do the exercise together. And the analogy to startups is exactly the same. It's like I can help you with the exercise. You know, sometimes it's more of like a pair programming thing. You're working on a thing. We can work on it together and I can give you like direct feedback to make it the best that it can be as we're going through it. And sometimes it's kind of like, hey, this is a really cool problem. I just kind of want to jump in on this particular thing and, you know, let's let's do it. And, and we see kind of where it goes. And so it's turned into this weird mixture of like, a little bit of like thought partnership, you know, really banging around an idea until we get it to a good spot, a little bit of growth coaching, honestly, a little bit of therapy, um, being a founder, being an exec, like building a company is, is challenging. And so like, there's often times when someone will come and like, oh my God, I made this giant mistake and what am I going to do? And da, 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 da. And I'll share like a bigger, way worse thing. I'm like, yeah, don't worry. Here's the thing I did. It was way worse. You'll be fine. It'll work out great. And it just kind of feels better. And out of that has come this book I'm writing called Quietly Crushing It, which is about helping kind of anybody who works as a, a knowledge worker in an office or from their home office, basically like unlock big impact without having to pay for it with the burnout that, that you truly have. So love that. That's the, that's the arc. I love that. Okay. So I kind of want to unpack that a little bit um, because you mentioned a couple key points that I think would be valuable to people that are listening, whether they're entrepreneurs or people starting out in their career. 
Um, so the first thing that I, I wanted to ask there is what was the thought process in going into engineering and what made you think that that wasn't right for me necessarily and you wanted to go more in the business uh, side of things? Because a lot of people, they go into one stream, obviously in university, it's crazy that you have to kind of like pick what you want to study at yeah. 17, eight, 16 years old. Um, and then most people do change somewhere through university. What was your thought process in that or what advice would you have for somebody who is doing a university degree but might want to pivot? Ooh, that is a loaded, much inside of that question. Uh, why, okay, so why engineering? Uh, I was always super interested in just like tech. Um, so that kind of fit. And I've always, I think, had this value that's just kind of evolved over time of like running after the hardest thing. And engineering was just really hard. Like I knew that it was going to be like a very significant intellectual challenge from the earlier stages and something about that, I guess, appealed to me. And then when I got into uh, the workforce, you know, I think what I, I learned is I, I fundamentally love problems, you know, breaking down a problem. And there's a lot of that um, on the engineering side. But what I realized is the, I felt that the biggest contributions I could provide to the solving of a problem was not going to be on the technical side. You know, there were always people who were, you know, smarter, better, faster, more technical, and they just loved the like technical challenge of like, what does the technology need to do here? How are we going to make it happen? And I didn't enjoy that as much as I enjoyed like, who's Anthony? Like, what are we trying to solve together? Why is he interested in solving this problem? Who's going to actually use the solution to this problem? Who are they? And that was always just kind of what interested me. I don't think I would have said at the time, like, hey, I want to do business. It's only looking back that I can say that. And at the time, I was just like, I want to get exposed to more than just the technical aspects of, of a problem statement. And so I would say, you know, to people who want to shift, like, do it. You know, like I think I got a lot of social pressure. There was always the question of like, you invested all of this time into engineering and it's a relatively good career path. Like, what are you doing, you know, here? And I just kind of went towards what I enjoyed. Like, I'm lucky that my brain, for whatever reason, is just wired, you know, to, to do that kind of a thing. And I think like you take a small step, like I, I jump. I joined this company for free and, and, you know, I work with them for a bit and like, I wanted to try it out, you know, and it was either going to work really well or it didn't. I might've jumped in and learned like, oh, actually the technical problem solving is what I'm most interested in. I, I should really try to stick with that. And you can always shift and juggle around. So I like to, there must've been a lot of, um, uh, social pressure for you because oh, yeah. I don't know how, um, what your support system was like at that time, but a lot of parents, particularly ones that even uh, peers as well. Like you probably had friends through all engineering. They're like, Jason, what the hell are you doing here? Yeah. Like you're destined to get a good job, high paying, go do your thing in engineering. And you're like, no, I'm going to go work somewhere for free. Like how did yeah. you overcome that? Did you have a good support system around you or did you have to kind of battle on that front? Uh, yes to both, you know, like very lucky, great support system around me, but like, still very challenging. You know, it's hard, it's hard to do a thing that other people around you aren't doing. You know, it just feels good when it's like, okay, I'm going with the group. You know, it feels less good because you're just second guessing yourself all the time. And like, I can look back at now on it now and say, it was an amazing choice. At the time, I wasn't thinking to myself, I'm the smartest guy on the planet. Like, this is exactly what I should be doing in my life. At the time, it was like, rapidly oscillating constantly back and forth between like, oh my God, I just like been my life. What am I going to do here? Like, I'm never going to be able to get another job. Blah, 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 blah. And like, oh, this is actually really great. You know? And so you just kind of steer towards the great stuff and do more of the great stuff and try to quiet the voice in, in my head that was like not the most helpful for me and test and learn. Like, I think that's the that's the thing I really took away from it. So a big thing right now, especially on social media, a big trend is get what, get paid for what you're worth, right? And that working for free, although was very popular years ago for like internships or like whatever is becoming less and less popular now. Um, what kind of advice would you have for somebody who is looking to get experience and potentially 
work for free like you did, um, would you recommend that or when would you not recommend doing that? The not one's easy. You know, the, the not one, I never really, I don't feel like money is the best motivation, but it is like banged into our heads that like you need to measure yourself with how much money you make. And it's funny because it's one of these things that like in our society, like we don't talk about how much money we're making. You just kind of look at people and you make judgments about like, ah, oh, this person's probably making X or Y, their job is blah, 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 blah. And like, where do I fit, you know, somewhere in that, in that broad spectrum. And so it's hard not to measure yourself with money. Um, but thinking about like the true motivation, I think is really important. Like there were skills I wanted to learn. And like, quite frankly, if I was to think about it from an employer's perspective, you know, what did I have to sell them at the time? You know, it's like, yeah, I could do business. Great. Tell us about a business that you've done before. Oh, I can't do that. Okay, cool. Well, like talk to us about like how you would build a balance sheet or run like a profit and loss. Oh, I, I can't do that. Well, what about like managing a team? You ever done that? No, I've never. So like, what are they going to say? You know, the only thing I can do is be like, take a risk on me and let me de-risk that for you as much as I possibly can. And the best way I can is, okay, don't pay me anything for a little bit. And like worst case scenario is I make an epic mistake and like screw something up and you have to like fix the thing, but we can figure that kind of stuff out. And so, I, you know, this idea of like, you got to pay me what I'm worth. Like, I don't know, I'm in the school of thought that like you literally can't put a dollar figure on my life. Like you can't, I can't put one on yours. There's no way. Like I, I could never measure your value with dollars. And so for me, I think now looking back with the clarity I have now is it's much more about like, well, what am I getting out of this? You know, I wouldn't want to work in a situation where I'm not being paid and someone's taking advantage of me. That would be really bad. But I was getting something very tangible in return. You know, I, I, I don't know of a way that I could have really learned how to like raise VC funding other than like going through it. You know, you can sit in a classroom and somebody can explain to you, this is how you do it, but then go try to do it yourself. You're going to learn a heck of a lot. And so you know, again, now looking back, it's like, it seems financially like it was a stupid decision, but the alternative was go get an MBA and pay $90,000 for that. So actually, like, I think I came out ahead financially and, you know, I definitely came out ahead experientially, not to say an MBA is not great. You know, I think if what you want is to go and like really study a lot of the um, core management science behind business, like I have a lot of pe friends that did MBAs and like they're phenomenal people who've learned some incredible things. That was their path. It's great. Go for it. But their path doesn't need to be my path. My path doesn't need to be their path. And so I just think about like, what am I trying to get out of a situation? And do I think that there's like a fair exchange here? Money's involved for sure. And you know, it didn't last that long. Like would I have worked for free for six years for them? Like no chance. You know, it was a small handful of weeks or months. Like it didn't last, you know, very long. And the trade-off was giving me access to things that frankly, at that age, like if I could have paid for that, I, I probably should have. Right, right. You know, I probably should have. I'm a big believer on that because uh, this story really relates a lot to me because in uh, university, I did a uh, health science degree in kinesiology. And then afterwards, I was also like interested in finance. And right when I got out of school, it was 2012. And uh, like Snapchat just came out. Instagram was in its infancy stages. Um, and I was like this whole digital social media thing, internet thing, I want to be a part of it. So I like pivoted and the first business experience that I got was working for free at a AI startup. And, uh, still to this day, I, I know all those people that I worked on that startup with and we stay connected and we're friends, but even more than that for this topic is that I learned a shit ton yeah. about how to manage a software project, how to raise money what marketing looked like at that time. Yeah. And the best way of doing it was going and doing it with someone uh, at a startup or else I would have had to go back to school, just like you said. Yeah, I think like just fight the tendency to, to uh, simplify life down to a financial balance sheet is absolutely an aspect. You know, it's like very privileged to me to be able to sit here and say, you don't necessarily need to earn money from a job. Like that's not always true. You know, there's certainly, you said, when should you not do it? There are situations where if you are trying to keep a roof over your head, you got kids to feed, like working for free is probably not going to be an option for you and you probably shouldn't do it. But if you're at a spot in your life where you can make it happen, I think just narrowing the view down to, well, how much money is going to go in and out of this interaction is certainly an aspect, but it's it's one of many to think about. And, and 
you know, I personally just kind of reject any advice when someone tells me unequivocally, like you should do this or you should not do that. They don't know me. They don't know how I like to do things. You know, it's not that I think I always know best, but I've learned that like what works for some people doesn't work for other people. And like, just try, Yeah, you know, yeah, and like that. you That's take true. a small try and you see what happens. And the risk I took at the time felt monumental. And again, looking back, it wasn't that big. You know, at the end of the day, I still had an engineering degree. I could have gone to another company and worst case scenario probably was that I would wind up having to take a job I might not have loved to like earn some money and get back on my feet, so to speak. But and it didn't maybe feel like- try it again. Exactly. But also employers love that kind of experience. Yeah, you know, who? it's just, I don't know. You can overcomplicate stuff. Like yeah, I yeah. wanted to learn. They were prepared to teach me. This was the easiest way to make it happen. You know, take a swing, see what see what see what comes out of it. So another thing that you mentioned was when you started your first company and you raised venture capital money for that, um, uh, and then it failed. The investor thought so highly of you still that uh, he or she invested in your next uh, venture. Right. So they they put me in touch with the team at Airbnb. Oh, I see. So, so they thought so highly of you that they actually connected you with social Airbnb. investment. Yeah, hmm. yeah, and that was one of those moments where. Um, Listen, failing at a company, again, easy to like talk about it now. And I look back on it fondly in the moment. It was brutal, like brutal. You know, I, I had all of the negative self-talk you can imagine. I'm screwed. I, I've destroyed my career. Nobody will hire me again. What am I going to do here? You know, people are going to hate me. People think I suck. Da, 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 da. And I got very lucky that this investor, like it was a an amazing external signal for me that somebody whose money I had almost entirely lost had thought enough of me as we were going through this process that he was prepared to make a very significant recommendation for me. What do you think it was that he thought about you that impacted that decision? Yeah, I I mean, you'd have to ask him. um, But, uh, you know, just being clear on the way you want to do things and treating people right as you, as you go through it. And I I never hid anything from him. He knew what was going on in the company as we were working our way through. I tried to treat him and the other investors properly and the people at the company properly. And like, just remembering that there's, there's more to the business than the business's success or failure. It's a collection of human beings trying to accomplish a thing and like, you know, trying my best to be a good person and be good to other people as we go through came out the other end. It's like, could never have predicted that. You know, I assumed the company was going to go up and to the right and, and it wasn't going to crash and it would be amazing and da, 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 da. And it didn't. And because I guess I went through that in a way that felt right to me, you know, it, it landed the right way with folks, even when things didn't go the way we want in terms of the balance sheet of the business. And uh, you mentioned that you had your first kid on the way during that period of time. That was a bit later. A bit later. Yeah, that was, was that like, when you were at Airbnb. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So first kid on the way. Yeah. And then, uh, um, so tell me before we jump into that and like family life or whatever, um, uh, tell me what it was like growing or being a part of Airbnb's growth like that. What was your biggest takeaway from that moment in your life? It's a common question. Hard to find, like picking a single one is, is tough. And I hate repeating the same answer over and over and over again, but I think, um, probably two, um, the first is like, it really codified this idea of like putting people first. Airbnb is a very people first company. Um, I think up until that point, I I always knew that people were important, but I thought of them as like one of many important elements of accomplishing something great in business. And so if we're trying to accomplish a thing, we have Anthony on the team, Anthony's doing a job. We need that job done. If Anthony isn't going to get the job done, we can just like rip and replace. We'll put somebody else there. Like it'll be great. And, and, you know, I was a lot more um, stick than carrot. Like here's the goal. This is what we have to accomplish. We've broken it down. Like now go hit the numbers and, and, and make it happen. And what I learned coming out of Airbnb is like a lesson I draw on all the time is like, you take care of the people, they'll take care of your problems. And you can't predict the way that that's going to bear fruit but you just have to make that investment on faith. And and Airbnb was like a very, very, very people first company. You know, one of the things that was happening all the time was like, I joined this place and, you know, we were at off sites all the time. Like, and they were fun. They were strategic, but like not cheap. You know, you get a bunch of people, you do some strategy stuff and you like go do a wild experience or something like that. We were having these things all the time. And at the time I kind of resisted it. I was like, what is going, like, I have huge targets to hit. I got to be executing right now. Like, why do we have to stop and talk about strategy? But what I realized over time is 
there would always be like an amazing nugget that would come out of one of these strategy sessions that I never could have predicted in advance. And the company was growing so quickly that, you know, it would be very easy for like Anthony and I are executing in our lanes. We're not talking to each other. We're growing really fast. And like, it causes a lot of self-inflicted wounds. But when we get together and we talk about, this is what I'm doing. This is what's important for me. This is why it's important for me. This is what you're doing. This is why it's important for you. How do these things fit together? You wind up staying aligned in a way that, yes, it's not the most efficient. You know, it would be nice to be asynchronously aligned. And there's like this beautiful Google sheet that just like, I find it doesn't usually happen that way. But when you sit down with somebody and talk to them and, you know, really understand what they're working on and why they're working on it, you wind up being able to do things that you probably couldn't have if you were running in, in your own lanes. And so the, the people first mentality is one where now you put a problem in front of me, no matter how businessy it looks, my first questions are always about like, who's working on it? How are they motivated? What are they trying to accomplish? How are they feeling right now? How are they working with the other folks that are involved? Who's on the other side of this problem that's gonna consume the solution? What are they trying to do? What's important for them? Usually that's where the solution comes from, but it doesn't feel like that's where the solution comes from. You usually wanna dive into like, we're trying to grow revenue, great. Like, let's get right into the tactical stuff and the da 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 da, -da like pull apart the numbers. That stuff's important. I'm not saying it's not important. But I like to start first with like, who are the people, what's going on for them? And like, are they in a position to solve or do they have the conditions they need to create the best solution possible? And how do we focus on that? Make sure that's in place. It's not that everything else will take care of itself. That makes it feel like the work is easy after that. But if you get that step right, the probability of success of every step after that is, is significantly higher. I feel like that's so important, especially as the company is growing. And people take uh, people ignore that because it's so much easier when you're five people in a small room to just like free flowing ideas and know what everyone is thinking. But as it gets bigger, it's a lot harder to do. It's actually something I wanted to ask you. Um, do you have any kind of like tangible um, advice that you have for founders scaling a company? Because your next venture was you started from team member three, right? Yeah. And but you also came from that Airbnb experience where you grew rapidly. What kind of advice do you have for founders that are scaling um, and it's more difficult to maintain company culture and ethos during that period of time, um, you know, just because lack of access to the founders that set that ethos? Yeah. Um, what advice would you have for those founders? Yeah, this I mean, this is a very unsexy answer, but I'll I'll give it like very early on making a strong investment in culture, you know, and, and people. Culture is not like we bought a ping pong table and like we go for drinks on Friday night. It's like, how do we work together as a team? And definitely the founders can't be the, uh, the only folks that push the culture and the values inside of the company. Like it has to be a thing that everybody at the company is doing. And so spending a little bit of time, like actively thinking about how do we wanna work, right? Like not just the things we wanna do, that's a strategy, but how do we wanna work with each other here? We might call that values. You can call it whatever you want, but like codify those things. And then these are the things that we're prepared to pay for. And I think that that is a, a, something that gets lost in a lot of the rhetoric around values. You know, we get eight, nine, 10 values. We stick them on a poster on a wall. You know, I, I find that in general, that tends to work less than it does actually work. You know, it's, it's fewer and further between that a strategy like that works. And the reason why I think is to me, you have a small set of values and we're going to pay a price for these things. Meaning what kind of business will we not take on? You know, if a customer comes to us and, and they're, they stand for a certain thing, would we turn them down? If they're asking us to solve a certain problem that we don't believe in, would we turn them down? If I have an employee working at my company who is a genius, brilliant at their work, driving incredible results, but they don't fit the way that we want to work inside of this company, will we fire that person? These things have like tangible bottom line costs. It's really hard to do that when you haven't codified like what are our values, how do we want to work? Or when you've done it to the point where we've got 15 things, you know, you, you can always argue that you're living one of those 15 things. When you've got two or three or four that are like deeply held inside of the company, anyone can understand them, you can hire against them and you can pay the price when you need to pay the price. We're not going to take on this business. We're going to fire this customer. We're not gonna hire this particular person or we're gonna let this person go. What things are you gonna truly pay the price for? Wow, I love that. That really hit home for me, especially. Um, okay, cool. One last thing before we, I wanna talk more about like the tactical stuff in your book. Um, but one thing that has been a common trait for people that 
are lucky enough to have a family life that I've had on the podcast has been around relationships and being a father or, you know, uh, a parent uh, while uh, progressing in your career. Any advice that you would have for um, high achievers, founders particularly, raising a kid and navigating a spouse relationship (laughs) um, while you're probably stressed out thinking about work and uh working a lot of hours another hard one um, i know that's a hard one read my, I, man, read my book. I think about that all the time yeah. because i'm like right now if i had like a kid in my life or if i had a spouse who maybe wasn't aligned with me uh about what i was trying to accomplish it would be fucking hard Marriage counseling aside, you know, if you have a if you have a partner that is not aligned with what you're trying to accomplish, uh, that's tough. I, I don't know how to help people with that particular problem. I'd like to say that that I do, but I don't. And you know, I've been lucky that you know my wife is very supportive of the things that um that I've done. It actually feels great. Like she's doing a startup now for the first time in her life, and it's fun for me to get to experience you know the the other side of that and trying to help support her. So like making sure everybody around you is supportive is important, but when you first started uh, dating or when you got married, was there some kind of conversation you had to make sure that they, that they were aligned with this kind of like ambition or along the way, was there some kind of checkpoints that you did in order to make sure you were aligned or was it just straight luck? Yeah, probably neither, you know, like you have your values as a human, I think, and, and, you know, finding a partner again, like finding someone who's aligned with those things is, is important. Um, but in a lot of ways, like my wife is not usually as uh, like comfortable with risk in the same ways that I am. And certain risks that drive me nuts, she's super comfortable with. And 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 risks that she thinks are crazy, I'm very comfortable with. And so it's a partnership just like, you know, a partner that you might have, not just like, in the similar vein as, you know, folks that you would work with, like we're not, we're not both great at the same things. And as a result, like together we're, we're better. And I'd like to say it was this great calculated thing, just like a job interview where I was like, you have to be okay with blah, 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 blah. Otherwise this is not really going to work. It kind of just, you know, over time, if something's important to me, she supported me. And I I, like, I feel very fortunate for that. And then I I think, you know, how to kind of balance it all is like kind of this idea of balance, I think is bullshit in a lot of ways, Uh, particularly, uh, Maybe I shouldn't say particularly because I haven't experienced a lot of the non-founder stuff, but as a founder, like I can't not take my home work, my work home with me. I just can't. My brain is always chugging on like some problem, you know, that is going on or some opportunity. And, and likewise, I can't leave my family at home. You know, I'll be at work sometimes and I'm thinking about like a thing that's going on for my son or my wife. And like, I just, I stop trying to fight that, you know, this idea of like, there's going to be work Jay from this moment till that moment in the day. And then there's going to be home Jay from this moment till that moment. Like it's super tough. And instead I, I, I started thinking about, I put some of this stuff in the book, like how do you enjoy whatever the experience is that you're having in this particular moment? You know, everyone says like live in the moment. I like, what does that mean? I don't know what to do with that. Like I'm not a monk. It's hard for me to just like meditate on that thought. You know, I'm a big fan of meditation. I do it every day, but like, I can't just sit and think about that concept. Like, but how do you take whatever needs to be done? Like right now, I want to be present here with you and I want to have a conversation with you. And right now I'm focused on this, not the 16 other business things and 32 other you know family things I have going on. And what I kind of learned is, you know, I, I would argue that like, you're probably wrong. If you did have a kid right now and you cared about this kid, like you would find a way to balance it and not balance like a scale you know, but balance it. Like there are things at work that give me energy and they suck my energy. And there are things at home that give me energy and suck my energy. And you got to find a way to like plug those things in. You know, I I love being a dad. That's not to say that there aren't some moments where I'm hanging out with my family and I'm like, man, I would really like to be working through a financial spreadsheet right now, which is like my least favorite (laughs) thing to do at work. I love my kids. Right. But you have moments where it's like, this, this is really, really hard. And I want to be doing something different in this particular moment. The kids are screaming, they're whipping shit at me. Like, it's just the way that it goes. Like you have those thoughts. It's totally fine. And just finding a way to like, if things are a little bit more challenging at home, you know, I try to do some stuff that I know bring me, brings me energy at work. And if I'm dealing with a particularly stressful thing at work, I try to make sure that I'm, you know, injecting in some family stuff that I know is going to bring me energy. And so it's less about like, 
how do you discreetly handle these things at the same time? And it's more about like holistically what's going on in life. Like it's great. I'm fired up to come and chat on this podcast. It's going to make me hopefully fired up for the rest of the day. And that energy is going to carry into like when I go home and play with my kids. And sometimes you get a low in either one of these places and just thinking about like, you know what, today I was supposed to do the financial spreadsheet, which is not my particular jam. I'm not like feeling it at this moment. You know what I really love doing? Like I love going for coffee with various employees. I'm just going to do that. And it might not be the single most impactful thing I could do in this particular moment in terms of how I'm going to move the business forward, but it could be the single most impactful thing I could do in my life in this moment to help me like, you know, continue to, to charge at the pace I'm charging. I love that. Thanks for sharing that. No problem. Because I feel like it's just, it's a, it's a common trait that all human beings have, um, which is like navigating relationships, particularly the intimate ones at home. Um, but especially because you said at the beginning of the podcast that um, like founders, uh, mental health is like something that is difficult to go through in the yeah. various phases of being a founder. But it's also something I don't think is talked enough about. And most founders are young and da da da, right? But uh, balancing family life and all the stresses of being a founder, it's something I believe needs to be talked more about. You got to find the right place to put it too. You know, early on, I would bring home everything about work to my wife. And that's putting a lot of burden on her. You know, like she has her own stuff too. And what I learned over time, and this is why I love doing this for other folks, is like as a founder, uh, it's hard sometimes to relate to people who are not founders. It's not that somebody else's job who, you know, works for whatever, a bank or, you know, a consulting firm is better or worse. It's just so fundamentally different that, you know, sharing what's going on for you and why it's feeling the way it's feeling might actually be anti-helpful for you because right, right. they'll look at that problem and, and they'll look at it through the lens of their corporate structure and the way that it works in their profession. And they'll bring all of that to bear on you in a moment where like, you know, that's not how I'm feeling. I'm not feeling it for that way, for that reason. And the same works, you know, at home with my wife. It took me years to learn that like, there are certain things to bring home and talk to my wife about, not because she doesn't care, not because I don't want to share them with her, but like, it's stressful to bring home certain stresses that, are, you know, it's just not part of her world. I'm just adding stress to her plate. That's not great. Now, if I hold on to that stress, that's not great either you know, finding the right place to put it. And I think that's what a lot of people don't spend as much time talking about is you need a therapist, find a therapist. Therapy is amazing. It's a great thing to do. It's not a sign of weakness. Go and do it. You want a coach, grab a coach. You want an advisor, get an advisor. If you're bottling this stuff up, that's a recipe for like, at some point, the top's going to pop. You don't know when, but it's going to happen. Nobody can bottle it up for that long. So find the right outlet. You know, make sure that it's the right spot and like burdening your partner at all times with everything and expecting that they can be that person for you at all times, I think is a very like, in my experience for my relationship is an unfair and unreasonable expectation for another human being to hang on to. I love that. <laughs> that was probably like one of the best parts of the podcast for sure. Um, Cause it's so relatable to so many people. Funny direction we went in here. Yeah. And that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to skip ahead now for the last 15 minutes of the podcast. I really want to learn more about your book. Yeah. So can you tell me the inception story of it? Like what made you want to write a book? Like that's an endeavor, yeah. uh, probably your find the hardest path thing and do that. <laughs> uh, that you spoke about earlier. Um, but tell me about the inception of the story. Why did you name it what it is? And then I'd love to dive deeper into like some of your biggest key takeaways for people. Yeah, it's a bit of a of a rough story. But um, four years ago, uh, Wednesday, my sister passed away from cancer um, when she was uh, 37. And it really like it shoved me out of this mode that I was in where I, I had never had an experience to me that felt this like unfair and out of order. You know, you're around death, but like you expect, okay, my grandparents are going to pass away at some point and my had, mine had, and it felt like the natural order. My sister didn't make it to 40 and yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, you know, I, I, I couldn't bring her back and it felt like a moment that I couldn't ignore, you know, and, and I realized that I'm choosing, I'm living my life a certain way without making a choice about the way I'm living my life, which was I'm charging as hard as I possibly can, trying to achieve as much as I possibly can. I was spending a lot of time without realizing it, living in the future, thinking the way I'm going to get balance in my life 
is I'm going to work as hard as I can now so that I don't have to later. Then I realized later, what's the probability of later, you know? And if I, if I, if I, you know, completely sell the farm for later, that is not the best strategy. You know, I have to be thinking a little bit more about now. And so the book kind of started not as a book at all. It started as like a coping mechanism. Um, I kind of took this test and learn men- mentality and I, I realized like between the startup I was in at the time and I was very fortunate to work with an incredible team. They're very supportive of me in that, in that moment in my life. I realized I'm for sure going to crash and burn in a very material way. Like I could feel that I was going not up into the right, like down into the right. And the slope was like aggressive. You know, I wasn't going to be able to keep all the balls in the air. And I was ignoring a lot of emotional stuff with work and I wanted to try to figure it out. And so I just kind of put aside all the preconceived notions I had about like, this is what I should be doing, you know? And I started trying like everything. I was reading a ton. I had a therapist that was very helpful. And basically if I like read or heard about a thing that could help me feel better or do better, I tried it. And I just experimented like a ton. And I mean like a ton with everything you could possibly, you know, imagine, you know, I was um, hanging from a bar for three minutes a day. I was doing like cold plunges to see how that would help my dopamine. Like I started intermittent, like all of them. I tried every single thing and I was keeping track of like, is this making me feel better and or do better? And through that, I kind of dropped the ones that weren't working. I tried, uh, I'd read a book on like the microbiome and how if you get your microbiome to a certain spot, it's really good for your mental health. And so the, the solution there is like no more soap. So like I washed my hands, but like there was no like shampoo or anything like that. And uh, that one lasted like four days. <laughs> I think in retrospect, I should have realized that like this is one I probably don't need to <laughs> don't need to run. Basically came up with like an impact tracker, which I talk in, in the book about a little bit. But pretty much every day it was like a little micro journal. I wasn't a big journaling guy. I wasn't going to write, you know, for hours. But I basically just ranked like how am I feeling? Um, you know, how do I feel my impact was today? And what did I do? Like, what tests am I basically running? And I would just kind of look at that. And, you know, every couple of weeks I would throw in a new thing, get rid of a test that wasn't working. I did this a lot and I started to feel like remarkably better. And it was going so well that I thought like, maybe I should deploy this at work. You know, and what I realized is there's so much self-help stuff out there about like things you should do in your life as if work is somehow a separate thing. When I dove into work and I said like, I'm just gonna forget all the stuff that I was taught or that feels like the way I need to do it and I'm just gonna experiment now. Same kind of thing, like I'm gonna set no goals. Let's see what happens when we do that. I was a very goal oriented person before. I'm gonna set no goals. I'm gonna set only goals. I'm only gonna do stuff that I have goals for. I'm gonna work, you know, 20 hours a day. You know, there's that stuff about like Michelangelo and like there's all this stuff you can do with hacking your sleep. I'm gonna try that. I'm going to work seven days a week. I'm going to work three days a week. I'm going to take no meetings. I'm going to do only meet like everything. <laughs> I just like bang through all these tests. And again, this is where like my team was, I, I don't know what it was like to work with me. It must've been like <laughs> ridiculous, but I started to find that there were some things I could do that would really make me enjoy the impact I was having at work. And this is what I learned was like critical for me is I couldn't not work. I, I needed the impact. I wanted the impact in my life of what was happening at work, but I didn't want it to come with the burnout. And so as I worked on this more and more, I would be talking to it with, about it with my team. They started to try some of the things. It started to work for them, which was really cool to see. And then I became very passionate about like, I want to help people enjoy doing the hard things in their lives. And because I was always around business, it made sense that like, I'm going to help startups, the people in them, enjoy the incredibly hard journey that is like building a startup. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to get into that. So I started um, advising, coaching, and that's where it started to codify. A playbook really developed. I got feedback from my clients. You should really write this down. No one's really talking about this kind of stuff. And it turned into what it is today through some test and learn. You know, I said, I I originally tried it as a course. I didn't love building the course. So I thought I'll, I'll put it into a book. I broke it down into small tests. Let me write a chapter, see how that feels. It felt really good. Is this impactful for people? I shared it around, got feedback. And as the test kind of build, it's just turned into a thing where I'm like deeply passionate now about getting this book out. It's incredibly hard. It's kicking my ass, but we're near the end. And like, I'm super excited about it. So that, that was a very long origin no, no, story about that. the book. But What's it called? Why did you name it it? And uh, when's it coming out? It's or- called Quietly Crushing It. Um, I named it that because uh, this idea that like, there's just, it feels like there's three options today. 
there's hustle culture, which like we talked about is I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can now at the expense of my experience now for some future imagined experience I'm going to have. And then there's, you know, that's one way to get balance. The other way is I'm going to quietly quit or I'm going to just fully, you know, step out of the workforce. And I think the challenge with those options is you kind of give up on impact. And for a lot of people I learned, they felt like I did, is that like, I want to have impact at work. I, I'm very ambitious, but I don't want to pay for that with the entirety of my life right now. Right. And so I wanted to kind of articulate this idea of there is a third option or fourth option that, you know, we just don't really talk about much, which is this idea of like, we're, you know, quietly crushing, you can crush it, you know, and you can do it in a way where it's not, you know, killing the rest of your life. And it's this idea of, the whole crux is like, I want to help people work smarter, not harder. It's an expression everybody talks about. Like, what the hell does that mean? Right, yeah. You know, I never woke up in the morning and I was like, oh, I got to do a bunch of stuff. Here's the dumbest way I can do each one of these things. It'll be great. I'm always trying to work smarter, not harder, but nobody really explains like each chapter that I'm writing is this is a very specific challenge that many of us have at work. This is why we have that challenge. And here's a very specific tactic. You can go and try, like literally put the book down, finish the chapter in the next meeting that you roll into or in your job tomorrow, you can do this thing and you will see it will either make you feel better or it won't and you can move on to the next chapter. But really just distilling it down to like, these are the things that are getting in our way of having a huge impact, enjoying it along the way so that we don't burn out as we're going through it. Let's talk about some of these things. Some of the... Um because you did one with me, which yeah. was about miscommunication or broken telephone, which I immediately went and told like 50 people about. And now <laughs> my entire company is using the uh, brief back is yeah. what you called it. Yeah. Let's um, do that one. Let's do that one. Yeah. I'd love to like uh, learn more about that. That was like paradigm shifting. Amazing. Oh, good. Now you're really setting it up. It's got to better. <laughs> it better be amazing. So the, the, the kind of core idea of the playbook is like it's broken down into three uh, specific sections. The first is about how to create more space. And the idea here is how to find very common slowdowns at work and not get slowed down by those anymore. So you can accomplish the same amount of impact with less effort, or at least you know the same effort um, or more impact, same effort. So we need to create this space for the second piece, which is how to align your experience. And this is about like what matters to you and how do you deploy yourself at work in a way you're really gonna enjoy. And what I find a lot of conventional wisdom says is when you're working on kind of self-improvement, you always need to start with self-awareness. You have to start with, start with self-mastery. And my experience with that is we are all really, really busy. Nobody has time to really do much stuff, let alone like do some deep self-awareness stuff. And it's not going to happen off the side of your desk. Like you're not going to finish a report at 11 o'clock at night and then like open up your like self-awareness document and like knock out something that helps you realize, oh man, my life's going in the wrong direction. Like it needs real dedicated time. So we start on purpose with like, how do we create that space? So where are we most commonly getting slowed down and, and how do we stop those slowdowns from happening? And so, you know, what they didn't teach you in school, this is like, I think a, a good example of something like this because we do it in school, but you don't learn what to do about it. And so it's the idea of broken telephone, right? We've all probably played or seen people play this game. You start with one kid, you tell them a message, and then the kid shares the message with the kid next to them, with the kid next to them, da -da 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 -da, down the line until the person at the end says what they heard. And it's some radically different thing from what the first person said. And everybody has a hilarious laugh. And so for me, what is always interesting when you think about this is like it is an amazing articulation of how fundamentally poor we are at communicating with one another, one another as human beings. So they teach us in school that we suck at talking to each other. But everybody laughs about the fact that we screw up the communication and then nobody, an adult never steps in and says, and here's how to fix that, right? And like, we're gonna be talking to each other. It's like the most important thing we do. Why does nobody ever explain what we should do about this? And so you think about like, well, what, what's happening there and is this really a problem? There was this awesome study that came out like last year. Uh, what it found is the United States of America every year is wasting $1.2 trillion because of workplace miscommunications. There are only 14 countries on the planet that generate more than the United States of America is wasting in just workplace miscommunications alone, like countries' GDPs. And if you break that down to like, okay, fine, that's nice. Like, what does that mean to me? Like, I'm working at my job. What does that mean? You break that down, it works out to basically a full day lost for every single employee every single week. And the reason why we don't see it is because it doesn't happen in full day chunks. 
It's not like, oh man, I just lost Thursday to a miscommunication. You lose like three minutes on Monday, 15 minutes on Tuesday, an hour on Wednesday. And by the end of the week, all these miscommunications are basically stacked up until you've lost an entire day's work. I could totally see that. It happens all the time where like you go a certain direction with a deliverable or you have to have an extra meeting or exactly. this deadline gets pushed a day. And now someone who allocated eight hours needs to allocate nine hours to getting it done. These things happen all the time. That's right. And they just stack up and they stack up. And until you have a way of actually seeing that it's happening, you can't really figure out if this happened from miscommunication or for something else. And so the reason why I think it happens is I think there's two kinds of miscommunications. There's visible and invisible miscommunications. Visible are really easy. I'm talking to you right now. I say a thing that doesn't make sense to you. Your eyebrows go together. You kind of look up and I'm like, ah, Anthony did not understand what I just said. And I try again. I'm going to use different words. Those are easy. That's not co what's costing, you know, the $1.2 trillion. It, it, those are easy. Invisible miscommunications are where it's tough. That's when I say a thing to you and you understand it perfectly well, but your understanding doesn't match my intention because we're different people. And so one of the most useless questions that we ask each other is, did that make sense? Right. Do you understand? The answer could be yes. You know, if we're playing, um, the game of broken telephone, which by the way, you can do with adults and the same outcome happens and you stop somebody in the middle and you ask them, did you understand that? Of course I did. Right. I understood what they just said to me. They said some words to me. I got them there in my head. The problem is you interpreted them in a way that was not what that other person um, intended you to. So I can have myself be fully understood, but there's a, there's a breakdown there. And so then you start thinking, well, well, okay, what do we do? There's a very common misconception. And the misconception is that communication, great communication ends when the words leave my mouth. So when we think about communication, what we think about is, okay, I want to say this thing in this way. You know, you think a lot about these are the words I'm going to use. This is what I'm going to write in an email or a Slack message or whatever, whatever it might be. You think a lot about what is going to come out of your mouth. What we don't think about is what the other person is going to interpret. And so actually, in my opinion, great communication ends when you hear your intent repeated back to you. That's the only way to know. And so if you look at some of the like highest risk professions out there, uh, military, doctors, high voltage power people, they've solved this problem. Obviously, they still have like small incidences where things like this happen, but they've largely solved this problem. And they all use some version of what, you know, I would call the, the brief back. And what that is effectively is asking somebody to repeat what you just said back to them so that they can hear what you understood from that particular conversation. So you do a bit of research, you realize, man, these people are doing this. Like, why like, is this? Like a uh, surgeon's scalpel. That's right. Scalpel. That's whatever, right. You know? That's right. You know, we're double checking this stuff because if we screw this up, somebody will die. You know, if I tell you what hill to go and take, I'm not a soldier. This is probably a really you know, overly simplified example, but I tell you what hill to go and take. And, you know, I don't get that point across super well. We've got a major problem. You know, I'm a high voltage power person. Like, we better make sure that we double check our safety brief before we get out there because, like, it's dangerous. We have a, you know, very, very big problem. So why doesn't this happen in, like, the, you know, knowledge work area? Like, why doesn't, why aren't we doing this if we know that it can solve the problem? The reason is it's, like, it's awkward. You know, it's not a thing that we do traditionally in like day-to-day -day life. And so I started thinking about like, well, how do we make it easier for people to do this inside of a workplace setting? You can do it outside of work as well if, if you want to. And what it boils down to is there's basically two ways to do it. There's a good way and a bad way. The good way is about making it entirely about yourself. Wait, what's the bad way? You want to do the bad there. way first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the bad way would be, um, hey, Anthony, I really want to make sure you were listening. Can you tell me what I just told you? It's like incredibly condescending. You know, no one's going to hear that and be like, what a great guy that Jay is. And like, who's this that asshole? like puts the person on the spot, I guess. I am judging your ability to listen to me. It's not about that, right? So what you want to do is you want to keep it on yourself. The alternative to the bad way is, hey, Anthony, I really want to make sure that I did a good job communicating my point to you. Can you let me know what you took away from this conversation? So I can just quickly double check that. It's entirely about the job I did communicating my point to you not whether or not you're capable of listening to me, because I know you can listen to me. I just don't know how you're going to interpret the words that you hear. And you can, you can use it equally on the other side. Someone's giving you instructions or telling you something. I can do the bad version, which would be, hey, Anthony, I want to make sure that you did a good job telling me this thing. That's not going to feel great for anybody. 
the alternative is I want to make sure that um, I heard what you intended me to hear. I think what you just said is X, Y, and Z. And if you take this very small step, you will eliminate so much time, all of this workplace miscommunication, because what you're doing is when I ask you to give me a brief back, you know, I'll say a thing to you, you'll brief it back to me. And either I say, you got it. And we just invested 15 seconds to save us potentially, you know, hours, hours down the line, <laughs> or you'll say a thing. I'll be like, interesting. I understand how you interpreted it that way. That's not the thing that I meant. Let me try again. And so we're making the invisible miscommunication very, very visible now. I get to see this doesn't match, you know, what I intended to. Let me let me try this thing again. And if you do it enough, you know, I've worked on teams where like now we just say, can you brief me back on that? It's become culturally normal. We know that we're not trying to hurt each other's feelings. We're just trying to um, remove these miscommunications. And so if you do it enough with your team, it just becomes routine. It becomes very, very routine. I've already seen it myself because for everyone that's listening, it's like um, you told me this a month ago and I started it with my immediate team and now they just do it automatically. It doesn't take long. Yeah. Yeah. Because what you realize is you realize the huge benefit. You know, when I started doing this, I thought I was a pretty good communicator. Like I can get my points across pretty well. I think pretty deeply when I talk to people and, you know, structure my thinking together five, six times out of 10. I was lucky to be landing it in the way that I intended it. Again, not because I was doing something wrong or the person receiving the information was doing something wrong. We're just different human beings. And I can't predict the way that they're going to understand the thing that I'm saying to them. And what I learned is, wow, like four or five times out of 10, something's coming up that is misaligned from what I intended and we can fix it now. But before those, before I was doing the brief back, you really have no way to figure that out until afterwards. You've done all the work You've wasted all the time. It's like, you're happy about this deliverable. Yeah, I just finished this presentation. You show them, you're like, this is not what I was expecting us to yeah, do. I know, right. Yeah. And you're just like, ah, it's frustrating for me. It's frustrating for you. It adds up to this amount, a huge amount of wasted time. And so if you start doing the brief backs, you, know, you, can, you will see that you're able to carve out so much more space in your week and you're not doing any more work and you haven't reduced the amount of work that you're, uh, that you're trying to get accomplished. You're just working smarter, not harder by definition, but because nobody gives us these tactics, yeah, right. you know, what do we do? So for like folks listening, like you can literally take this and deploy it immediately, immediately. so much time. Next meeting you're in, next time you're talking to somebody, brief them back. It reminds me, a friend of mine was telling me, I think it was at Deloitte or like uh, Accenture, some kind of consulting company. They, they call, they do something called the 10, 50, 80 principle, which is, um, let's say I give you a task, you're on my team, I'm like go and do this, PowerPoint presentation. You go and you do 10% of it. Yeah. Then you get a gut check. Was I on the right path to what you were asking? Yes, actually you were, or no, maybe you got to deviate this way or whatever. Then you take it 50% of the way and gut, uh, gut check. Was this based off of what you originally told me for far enough along? And then you bring it to the 80%, the manager or whatever helps you put the cherry on top and you're done. Yeah. What a lot of people do is they'll go and they'll spend eight hours completing the deck, then get a revision on it and completely wrong direction. Yep. And you just wasted eight hours when if you did it in little chunks like that, you could have saved hours. For sure. I love it. Like getting feedback is a great, a great way to do that. You know, sometimes you don't necessarily even know what the right direction is. I think that right. can be challenging that's too. Yeah. And the thing I would argue is not that that's a bad approach. Do it. Love the idea. But like, why even wait for the 10%? Exactly. You know, if you do that at the beginning, then you right. might be able to skip some of these steps. That's right. Is is like pair the brief back with this yeah. you know, approach yeah, yeah. and you'll make sure that you don't waste that 10% because even 10% of a 10 hour project, it's an hour. Yeah. You know, like that adds up over, especially over a year. That's right. Forget a year that adds up over, you know, the course of a week. Like most people who are cranking out crazy hours in type A, they want to have big impact. If I told them they have a free hour every week, one one hour, like you would take that, yeah. you know, and this is probably happening, you know, four to 10 times a day. Mm -hmm. Right. And it might not be saving you a full hour. Like I said, every single time, but you add that up over the course of a week and, you know, just imagine right now, like getting an hour back or three hours back or eight hours back The eight hours is possible. You know, I can tell you from experience, like you, you can absolutely, you know, find ways like this to, carve out a whole whack load of time that you just, you, you can't realize it's there until you have a way to measure 
that something like this is happening. So what I would love to do, okay, is I'm gonna ask you three more questions. Great. One is super easy and quick. I'm gonna ask it to you in, after this first one. Okay. The first one's gonna be, I would love one more takeaway from the book. Okay. Um, uh, and then I would also love to just have you back on. This was like amazing. Cool. You have so much wisdom to share. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, uh, okay, so give us one more tactic from the book that like you think is most useful to people um, that really stuck out. Most useful. Okay, so let me ask you this. Um, what size of team do you want to choose your own adventure? So uh, something that's like of critical importance to us as we go through our lives is decision making. Nobody really teaches great decision making in school. I don't know why. It's the theme of your podcast. So like we could talk about decision making. I'm a big decision making nerd. So like we could spend, you know, all day on that, but it, it has two chapters dedicated to it in the book. I think two things are really important. How do you make great decisions and how do you make great decisions faster? You can pick which one of those do you want to? Well, I hear so often in all these books and videos that I see on YouTube that uh, the most successful people make decisions fast. Okay. So you want to do faster? Sure. Okay. So we'll play a game. Um, I think in the startup space, there is a common thinking that um, scale equals slow. As we get bigger, we're going to get slower. And right. that's just the yeah. way it has to go. That's what I hear. So I'm going to tell you some characteristics of a real company. And you're going to guess how long it takes them to make their average decision. And I'll give you bonus points, which I guess are really worth nothing, uh, if you can guess the company as well. Okay. So uh, this company has about 400,000 employees. Their budget's about $175 billion. Their decisions and their outcomes are quite long-term in nature. So when, when they do a thing, it takes a long time before they can learn whether that was the right thing or not. Many of their decisions um, are incredibly high risk. So an incorrect decision can lead to loss of life. And they have no uh, email, cell phones, or chat to help speed up their communication. So how- This is a company today? This is a real company. Okay. So how long do you think it takes them to uh, make a decision on average? Okay, so- if you didn't say the last part, which was the no communication aspect, that's that's going to throw a wrench in it. That must make it like this now becomes a riddle. But without <laughs> that, if it was like a normal company that had sure. those communication things, I would say like a year because they they make probably in like Q3 or four, they make decisions for the following year. And in order to pivot that, it would take at least two more quarters so I would say like anywhere between two quarters to four quarters to make a decision. Okay. So this company is like proof that you don't have to slow down as you scale. So it's 1960s NASA. Okay. And it's the 1960s NASA who uh, was working on the Apollo mission. So sending people to the moon. Landing people on the moon. I would expect them to make even longer That's decisions right. then. That's right. And they did, but they reworked the whole company around this incredible goal that they set themselves. And so landing people on the moon is like an unbelievable accomplishment. But then you like peel the onion a little bit. Like, how did they make that happen in that amount of time? Like you said, government organization, huge budgets, lots of people. This is going to take forever. They regularly demonstrate an ability to raise a challenge in the morning, talk the whole thing through, make all the decisions they needed to make, including resource allocation and budgeting by the close of business that day. So they were executing on it the next morning. And so I think that like 1960s NASA, decades ago, they basically proved that you do not need to slow down as you scale. And so why, why is this happening, right? You, you, you like hit a problem like this and then you hit such an obvious, you know, anti-pattern and you're like, why, does, why do we feel like we have to slow down? And the reason is um, we're actually building teams with a lot of really good intent in mind, but because we're not thinking about the features of the teams that we're building, the way we're building teams is what's causing us to slow down our decision-making. So what I mean by that? So the case for diversity is pretty much ironclad, right? When you have a more diverse team, you make better decisions, your company's gonna be better in pretty much every measurable way. If you don't believe that, another podcast or like literally Google it, like there's tons of research out there. Um, but the challenge is that as human beings, we're like very social animals. Like we talked a little bit earlier about it feels better when you're going with the group. We just push for consensus and agreement. Like that's the way that we're wired up. You know, if you and I are talking, we're going to try to get to a, a point of agreement. When we're building teams, though, what's actually happening is we're bringing on more people and we're bringing on more diverse thinking. The more people we have and the more diverse thinking we have, the more disagreement we're gonna have by definition. I could see that, yeah. And so the challenge we have is this idea that 
every decision or a great decision needs to have agreement. It doesn't. We need to have alignment. And it's this push for agreement that's what's slowing us down. And so actually, like somewhat paradoxically, the, the better we disagree, the faster we decide. But nobody really teaches us how to disagree super well with each other. And so one of the like single most important things, like if people take away one thing, I talk about this a bunch in the book, but like the one thing you can take away and do, if you want to rapidly accelerate how quickly your team is making decisions is before you have any debate about the decision itself, decide who's going to decide. Stop and make a decision on whose decision is this? Why does this help? So this basically stops analysis paralysis most of the time. So we might say there's three ways we could do this. Way number one is this is Anthony's decision. Great. Anthony knows that he's now empowered to make this call. We can have a big debate around the table as much as we have, as much as we need. But at some point, Anthony's going to tell us, okay, everybody, I have what I need to make this decision. I'm going to go and make it and I'll tell you what it is when we come back. Great. The second way is we can vote, right? We can say um, two weeks from now, we're going to get back in a room. There's nine of us on the team. We're going to take a vote. Amazing. However much debate and analysis we've done on the day of the vote is however much we need. We vote and we get going. And the third way is consensus. Not my recommended approach, but sometimes it's right in certain situations for certain folks. And in that situation, we do genuinely need to get to consensus. Everybody needs to agree with this decision before we're going to move forward on it. That's fine. Just do that on purpose because that's not like the other two. And so what I find with teams is usually they jump into, we've got to decide whether we're going to enter market one or market two. Great debate. We launch right into it. But we haven't taken half a second to say, wait a minute, who's going to actually decide this thing? Right, right. And so we get stuck in, we're going to talk about it in a meeting. And then we're going to set a, the only decision we make is we're going to set another meeting a week from now to get back in a room and talk about it again. And then we're <laughs> going to like, you know, do some more analysis just take a half a second. Sometimes it takes longer because we'll say, who's going to decide? And I'll say, it's me. And you'll say, it's you. Well, it's actually great that we have that out in the open because the first thing we're going to do is we're going to decide who decides. Should it be Anthony? Should it be Jay? Who else is it? it might be, but we're going to make that decision clear and present. As soon as that's done, you will find that you will get to the point of making the decision like so much faster, so much more efficiently than when we just launch right into the debate. It's not really clear. We make an assumption that it's like the most senior person in the room that's deciding, you know, there's all sorts of dynamics around that. You know, if, if so-and-so is the CEO and they're sharing their opinion, do I think they're telling me what needs to be done or are they just sharing the opinion with uh, me? Uh. But if the CEO has said, or as a team, we, we said, this is Jay's call and the CEO is sharing their thinking, I know exactly where to put that thinking. On the same playing field that's right. as everyone else. That's right. They're not telling me what to do. They're giving me context that I can then use to go and make the decision that I have been tasked with making. Wow, I love that. But we rarely call this out. You know, we just skate right past it and we don't know who's actually going to decide. So so one question. Oh, sorry, if you want to. I was just going to wrap it up with like, if you want to make it go faster, start by deciding who's going to decide. It's just a habit you need to build. And I have like a thing in my head now that the second I hear a decision, who's going to decide this? So a question is, is that, um, just one caveat that maybe you have an answer to, or maybe it's more complicated than that is let's say you allow one person to decide, right? How do you collectively say when that person decides we got to buy into it? Cause yeah. some people might be like, Hey, didn't, he didn't agree with me, rah, 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 you know, and like be upset about it. Is there any tips or tricks you have? To yeah. Find? I mean, this could be a whole podcast in itself. Okay. You know, you hear a lot about like disagree and commit. Um, which is, which is really important. Yeah, I think like, yeah, heard of that. yeah. So there's like agree to disagree, um, which I don't like that basically means like, I don't agree with you. And we agree that like, I don't agree with you, but that's not helpful when we're executing. Like, that doesn't feel like I'm aligned with the decision. That's different than I'm going to disagree and commit, which is like, I don't agree with you. And I'm going to treat this decision as if I made it myself. And I find the way to really help with that is people, I think want to be heard, even if they're not listened to. Meaning, let's say we're driving in a car and we have to make a super simple, like left or right. And you think left and I think right. Fine. You're driving the car. I tell you to turn right. If you just jerk the car to the left, I'm going to think like, what the heck, man? Like, I told you to go right. Like, what? You know, versus, Jay, I hear you that you want to turn right. I'm choosing to turn left for this reason. Here we go. Okay. You know, at least I know that Anthony took in the information I had for him and made the best decision he could having heard me. People want to be heard. 
I think the challenge pops in when you have someone who just makes a call, we don't necessarily know that they were the right person to make the call and they're not sharing the way in which they made the call. It feels like all the folks in the room who should have had a voice, they don't know necessarily that like, yeah, Anthony listened to me, you know, he heard me rather, and he might be doing the thing that I didn't recommend to him, but I know that he made his decision considering my input. And so I always try to make sure when I'm coaching people on decision making, I'm doing it myself, like make sure that people understand, like show them, you know, Anthony, you told me to turn, or in our case, like Jay, you told me to turn right. I heard you. This is what I think about that. And this is why I'm making a different decision. Mm -hmm. Now, I might not agree with you. I might still think, I still don't think left was the right way to go, but I can align around that now because I know that he heard me. I know that he had my context. I know that he hopefully benefited from the diversity of thought um, in the room and he's making the best decision he can. And I trust you because you're tasked with making this decision. And I want the same, you know, when I'm tasked with making this decision, decision. So rather than trying to convince people that you're right and they're wrong and this decision's better than what they were thinking, show them that you heard them. This is how I made my call. It incorporated all of the information and context from you. And now this is what I'm doing for these reasons. And that kind of step really helps people feel like, okay, I was involved in the process. I helped to make this decision, even though it's not the decision that I would have made myself. It's much easier for me to then commit to that decision and say, okay, don't agree. Let's go do it. Amazing. I love that too. Thanks. Um, okay. Last two questions. Ask this to everybody on the episode on, on the podcast. Um, where's a place someone could, if someone wants to follow along, connect with you online, where can they do so? Yeah. I mean, best bot is like, I'm super excited about the book, trying to get the word out about that. So that's it. Quietly crushing it book.com. It's long. So there's a shorter version. You just like QCI book.com. We have a pre-order up now. I think we're doing like 40% off what the actual list price will be when we launch later this year. Um, there's like a contact form there. You know, if you really want to get in touch, I love hearing from people, but like when folks get the pre-order, they're going to get, you know, monthly newsletter. I'm giving access to some of the earlier on chapters so they can read them, um, all sorts of stuff like that. So everything kind of funnels through there right now for me. Cool. And um, you definitely have to do the audio book yourself. <laughs> you got a good uh, radio voice. So when the audio book comes Is out. Is that like telling me I don't have a good face for anything else? You just no, <laughs> no. You, that, I, if there was a Facebook or whatever. I think there is a Facebook. Yeah, yeah, okay, I'm done with this question. All right, last thing, okay? I asked this to everyone on the podcast. Um, uh, and uh, I just would love to hear your opinion about this. Take as long or you need to think about it. Um, what's one piece of wisdom that you wish you knew a lot sooner? I have to pick one. Hmm. Uh, I'll tell you a thing that was like surprising and meaningful to me instead, because picking one of the like, that makes me feel like I'm some kind of wise person. But one thing that was really interesting to me is I remember kind of before my sister passed away and I was running a million miles an hour, I would get advice from people to slow down. And I remember thinking actively, like, I can't because my speed and my pace and my work ethic, like, is my edge, you know? And if I slow down, like, what's my edge going to be? And then after my sister passed away, I was physically forced to slow down. Like, I, I couldn't, you know, I could not keep up the pace. It just, it really wasn't working. And so I consciously decided to slow down. And what I thought I would learn from slowing down was that going slow is better and like ways to slow down. What I learned instead from slowing down is better ways to go faster, which was very surprising. You know, that like I could have more impact than I was having previously in a different way so that I don't have to be running as fast to be accomplishing as much as I was. And I think it took me slowing myself down to realize there's a better way to go, to go faster. And so you know, this idea that like the slow way is the fast way, it kind of feels very Zen. Um, but you know, the, it, the thought I would have for folks is oftentimes when it feels least beneficial to slow is actually the time when it is most beneficial to slow. And you don't have to think about it as I'm going to slow down and accept less. You're actually going to slow down and it will result in more. You know, so, so when it feels like your back's up against the wall, you got way too much to do. There's a billion things going on. You're trying to knock through a million deliverables. That might actually be the moment to like take a half an hour 
to step back and think, what am I trying to accomplish? What's really important? How might I structure th these things differently if I was thinking about impact instead of hours? And I bet that you do that a couple of times, a few of those, you're going to find like, there's a way better way that I could be doing this. So, you know, looking for those moments when it feels like the least beneficial to slow down and actually recognizing those is like, those actually might be the, the best times. Wow. I love that. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, and man, thank you for, for being on the podcast today. Just one of my favorite episodes for sure. Thanks, appreciate man. Appreciate you. Really appreciate being here. Thanks for having me on. Until next time, this is What They Did Not Teach You in School. 